a programmer really doesn't get into that level of thought process for the first 10, 15 years. It's an issue, right? Because there's a lot of reinventing the wheel happening all the time. Oh, sure. If it's a good idea, the good idea tends to spread unless there's somebody in the, at the management level working hard to make it not spread. Try and write about the things that don't change. People talk about productivity while at the same time doing everything they can to prevent it from happening. And the- Well, the, because they don't understand what, where the productivity comes from. Fred Brooks came up the other day in a conversation. I'm going, so here's a book that's really old, right? Fred was right. Man Month, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but with the exception of the chapter on punched cards, pretty much everything in, pretty much everything in that book is still relevant. <laughs> yeah. People not thinking enough of it. Well, there is that, right. But that seems like an odd. Well, I, I think you do want the old coots around, but, I, but you know, here's one that's what, 25 years now? <laughs> why, why doesn't anybody read this book? So I wrote this one not too long ago. <laughs> what are the ethics of being a programmer? That may be the last book I write. This episode was made possible thanks to Gotopia.tech. Hi, Bob. Hello, Alan. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm just fine. So we are tasked to talk about what are the two old but classic books today. And I, it was interesting as I, I, you know, I was reading through them in preparation for this again, and I, I haven't read them since they came out. So it's been a while. And one of the things that I had to say, looking through it is thank God we don't have to deal with EJBs anymore. <laughs> 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 and all of that stuff. But like, like a lot of the classic books, there's still certainly a lot of stuff in there that's just as relevant as it was the day you wrote the books. Um, you know, particularly the clean code book is that I look at a lot of code and clean is not a word that I would choose to describe the code that I'm looking at. And so, <laughs> um, so we could start out, I guess, by talking about, I, I'm kind of curious as if you were to write it again, how would you change it based on, on what's happening now as compared to what was happening then? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I might choose a different language. You know, Martin Fowler rewrote the re the refactoring book and he changed the language to JavaScript. Right. I don't think I'd pick that language. Um, maybe I maybe I'd use Python or or a language that's on the ramp up, getting more and more popular. If I had my absolute druthers, I'd use Clojure because I think that's the language of the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, closure people always say that. They've been saying well, that for I, 20 yeah. years, though. So. <laughs> it's taken a while, but I think it's on its way up. But um, the principles in the book, I would not change much. This is one of the, um, one of the things that I focused on in all, all my books, is to try and, try and write about the things that don't change. You know, there's a strategy with books that if you write about the stuff that changes a lot, you'll be able to sell a lot of books for a really long time. <laughs> and then you just have to write another book and another book and another book. And I've taken the, the opposite approach, right? I want to write about the things that don't change over time so that they are relevant for a very long time. And I, I hope that the clean code book and the clean coder book and so forth have remained relevant over the last a decade or so that they've been published. Well, they have, at the, certainly at the level that they address the problems. You know, it's another question, something else we can discuss is that one of the things that I respond to when I read all books that are basically heuristics, right? Books of kind of rules, right? Things to do, do or make things do right, is that um, they're very kind of context specific. In other words, when I look through your book, I'm saying this is great if what you are is a programmer and you're looking at the code, but you're not looking at the architecture, mm -hmm. right? Because it's all focused on starting with the code and refactoring and TDD and all this wonderful stuff that programmers should be doing, of course. But um, I, I look at some of your advice, which is great advice, but some of those issues could be solved by thinking architecturally rather than thinking just in terms of the code. Yes. Things like naming and that kind of stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you fix that, right? It's, people are, I, I guess, how do you fix it on many levels, right? Both on how do you fix the architecture, but also how do you fix people not thinking enough of it? Well, there is that, right? But, the <laughs> but you know, I think about things like DDD, right? DDD has been around forever, but it's suddenly gotten, gotten popular again because of microservices. And 
Is it microservices that did that? I think it was microservices that really? did that because people started people started saying, "Oh, microservices are bounded context," which is not true. But people started <laughs> saying people started saying it anyway, and all of a sudden people were reading about DDD because they read that microservices were bounded context. So I must at least ideas. something good came from microservices. <laughs> right. <then. laughs> well, I'm not as negative on them as you seem to be, but the the <laughs> the issue is that DDD is suddenly on the scene in a way that good. it wasn't. Before, right? Which is a good thing, right? Because it gives us organizational principles that help make the code better, make it cleaner, right? Is it, it uh, you know, it helps with a lot of stuff. It helps with names. It helps with everything. And um, so the problem that I have often, though, is that when I come in as a consultant to a company, the programmers are not thinking architecturally at all. They're just, they're just thinking about the code that's in front of them and it limits them. It limits what they can do, right? It limits how much they can clean stuff up. It, it limits, there's limits everywhere. And I would like to get rid of those, and I don't know how to do it, right? As people are really are set in their ways. So, so there just aren't enough old coots like us. You know? Well, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I talk about a lot, right? Is that the fact that um, the, the number of programmers in the world grows at an exponential rate, uh, and that leaves the, the number of old people compared to the number of young people at, a, at an impossible ratio. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You got um, half the programmers in the world have less than five years experience, right? And, and this continues to be true as long as we're growing at this crazy rate. That, that rate is going to have to slow down because there's only 8 billion people in the world and we're starting to get within range. Right. So, okay. <laughs> and, you know, so. Right. It's the vampire problem, right? If a vampire bites two people and they bite two people and they bite two people, yeah. eventually everybody's a vampire, yeah. right? And it doesn't take that long. It does not take that right. long, no. <laughs> so, you know, I write books like this and and uh, I wrote this one a long time ago, which is, you know, just yeah. chock full of, of this kind of, you know, Stuff that you learn the hard way after 15, 20, 25 years. Yeah. Uh, and I, I kind of hope that that makes its way out to the younger folks because there aren't enough guys of our experience on teams directing those teams. Yeah. But it's not just a number of programmers issue. It's also a ageism issue and a, a youth culture issue and at least I see that out here. Now, admittedly, I, you know, I, I'm in the Valley, so it's worse here than it is in a lot of other places. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but there we are, right? And the, the, yeah. um, it's an issue, right? Because there's a lot of reinventing the wheel happening all the time. Oh, sure. It would have to happen. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the ageism and a youth culture. How would you not have a youth culture if half the programmers always have less than five years experience? Everybody looks around and they say, well, everybody here's in their 20s. Yeah. This must be a, a job for people in their 20s. And, yeah. and you, know, you got the one guy in the back who's 40 or the one guy in the back who's 50 who's sitting there going, you know, wait a minute. I've been doing this for an awful long time. Why are you telling me this is a youth culture? But if, of course, that's the people coming in. Yeah. And, and people are paying attention to your books, right? Well, I hope so, some of them are. I hope so, right? But the, so there's wisdom in the books is that people are. So why is it that you'd be willing to read a book that has stuff in it written by an old coot? And no offense, because I'm one too. And the, and at the same time, um, the the you don't want the actual old coots around. It seems like an odd. Well, I, I think you do want the old coots around, but I, but you know, here's one that's what 25 years now. There's Anybody reading this? <laughs> Is there is any any of the young kids out there reading design that's patterns? A good question. You know what I hear about design patterns? Design patterns are an old idea that's now out of date because our modern languages take advantage of that. It's complete nonsense. Absolute nonsense. But I hear that over and over again. Here's a book. Oh, I'm sure you're familiar with this one. <laughs> Why doesn't anybody read this book? <laughs> Full of good information, you know? yeah. Tom DeMarco, structured systems analysis and specification. Yeah. Great ideas in this book. Why doesn't anybody read that book? Yeah. There's tons of information out there. Yeah, that's, that's old <laughs> and and good. I say it's old. Well, we, we, I was just thinking about that in terms of 
Fred Brooks came up the other day in a conversation. And I'm going, so here's a book that's really old, right? It's Fred Physical Man now. Month. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, with the exception of the chapter on punched cards, pretty much everything in <laughs> pretty much everything in that book is still relevant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always keep them handy. You never know when you're going to yeah. need one. Yeah, pretty much everything in there is relevant. And I, you know, is particularly Brooks Law itself is relevant. People don't seem to get that, right? All of the no estimate stuff that people have such fits about, that's all in Fred Brooks, right? Yes. Fred is talking about it. He's talking about how bad estimates are and how should, we shouldn't be basing basing our planning on estimates and stuff back then. And uh, <laughs> and that all seems to have gone by the wayside, which is really unfortunate. But but, but there is some there are some evolutionary things the other day. As I was I was talking to um um who was it? I don't remember anymore, but I, the, <laughs> another problem of being an old coot. But <laughs> we, were we were talking about the problem of design patterns in the context of simplicity, mm -hmm. right? And that the obvious negative of design patterns is that they're complex. They add some complexity to the system. And, you know, you had the, the fool me once, fool me twice rule in one of your talks or your books or something, which is applicable, I think, right? Is do it, do it as simple as possible and then add the patterns when in the refactoring stage when it yes. is that you need them. Right. And, um, but a lot of people don't get that subtlety and they'll read something like clean code and they'll, you know, you're, you're talking about open closed, for example, but that pulls in the design patterns, right? It pulls in command and it pulls in strategy and it pulls in dependency injection and all the stuff that adds complexity to the system. And I, you know, the, the biggest problem that I see when I look at code, um, when I come in as a consultant is that it's all way too complicated. You know, half of it doesn't do anything and half of what's left used to do something, but nobody looks at it anymore. And it, it, there's all the, all these, all this code solving problems that never happened because somebody thought they might happen. You mean, it looks like a whole bunch of kids have been tearing through the place and making a mess. <laughs> <laughs> it does, but it also, you know, a lot of it comes from, the old waterfall thinking that it's like expensive to make changes. So we, we want to try and think of everything in advance. Right. And um, certainly the, that. The, we need to fix that. Right. And the, the, the stuff that we're talking about is kind of complicated in a way because there's subtlety to it, right. There's nuance. You don't, it's not just a bunch of rules that you follow by rote, right. You've got to, it's got to, it requires thought and it requires yes. An understanding. Yes. Right. And so how do you develop that? Right. How do you so, get people to develop it? Well, <laughs> these, these are the, 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 the long term question. How do you solve world hunger? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so did you ever take a martial art? Yes. OK, yes. so I did, too. Mm -hmm. And and the way our instructors taught us is that they would have us on the first day. Right. They would have us on the mat and they would teach us one move. And, and in, in my case, it was jujitsu, right? So they would teach me one move, Hako Ru, Hako Royal, you know, escape from the opening. Okay, you're going to do that. And they would have us repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and go home and practice it, come back, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And when they thought we had gotten that move, they would add another move. Yeah. And this just would continue for a year or a year and a half. And by the time, you know, you were willing to get a, uh, you were ready to have a, a belt increase and then they'd add more and more and more. And eventually you got to the point where you got a black belt. Right. And, and during this entire time, it's all this rote re repetition of these moves that you focused for months learning and perfecting. And then you get the black belt and everything changes. And all of a sudden, it's now we expect you not to do any of that. Now we expect you to integrate. You have just begun. You are now a student and you may now integrate. And we don't want you doing those moves anymore. We want you figuring out from the situation you're in, what context and how to use what you've learned to escape or, or dominate the situation. And that's when the, the true learning really begins. We have an industry where you get, you get kids that, that graduate from college, all they've learned is three of the 50 moves that they need. Right. And they're thrown into the environment where they have to write code. And that's all that comes out is those three, three moves. And there's nobody to help them learn the other moves. And there's nobody to help tell them that the real goal here is to 
get those moves so well under your skin that you can begin to integrate them. So you were talking about the nuance, right? You were talking about the complexity. Well, that, that takes time to learn, time to get good at. A programmer really doesn't get into that level of thought process for the first 10, 15 years, in my experience. Maybe I, it took me that long. <laughs> Yeah, but it can go fast. I'm a I'm a big big mob mob programming ensemble programming kind of guy. Right? Mob programming, good idea. Um, yeah, and one of the reasons I like it is because it helps shorten that curve a little bit because you're you're collaborating, hopefully, with at least a few people that really know what they're doing. And I think some <laughs> of it, I think some of it rubs off, right? Is that or even yeah. even if you only know three things, right? The other people in the mob know three different things. So by the time, as you start working together collaboratively, you all start learning the things that the other people learn and it all goes a little bit faster. But I'm still seeing a lot of resistance to that, right? Mob programming is like one of those things where when I do a mob programming workshop, I come in and everybody's going, hmm, I don't know that this can't possibly work. And by the end of the week, they're going, how could we ever have been programming without doing this? And the, the, but making that transition is hard, right? It's people, it, it, they have to experience it to really kind of get it to the point where they're willing to try it. And, um, you know, it gets us back to the, how do you make the changes problem, right? Is that the, the bunch of kids in the room that, that think everything's perfect and they, and the, the, and management is fighting against them, right? Some manager going, well, well, five people sitting around watching one people, one person work. We can't have that, can we? And the, the, um, uh, it, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's a hard problem. It's like, I guess I think about this because this is my life is trying to convince people to do things that they ought to be doing, but they, they aren't and resist. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been through that mill so many times. You're trying to convince, trying to, that's why, you know, why I'm in all, well, I don't try and convince them. Them. You can't convince them. Them, Right. And you're right. You can't convince. You, yeah. you can demonstrate, you can exhort, you can, you can uh, encourage. And a few people, will get it. A few people will learn and they will follow. And, and then what you've done, you consultant, you, is <laughs> you have started a war inside that organization. Right? And there's suddenly a group of people that has one set of values that are opposed to another group of people who have a different set of values and they cannot coexist. Somehow or another, they either have to learn from each other or there's going to be a divorce. And, and that's something I've watched over and over again is, you know, the, the people that I that I teach and exhort will either eventually become the only people in the team or they will flee the team. Mm. Right? And it, I don't think it works any other way. Sometimes you can get and you wonder how you wonder how a captain, a ship's captain gets gets the entire crew to act in unison. How did, how do they do that? Yeah. How does the military manage to pull this off? Well, there are all Marquette, there's Marquette's books, right? You read Marquette's books. I and, don't know. I haven't read Marquette's. Books. You should have, right? Uh, uh, Turn the ship around. is a great book. Oh, okay. And, um, he was a submarine captain. So it was a small group, right? Is that the, I don't know if you can expand that out to, to business size, but it was what a team of what, 50 or 60 in a submarine. That's still a pretty good, good size. Just a good size. It's a good size group, but it's not like an enterprise with 6,000 people. Yeah, in yeah, it. Yeah. And um, he basically empowered everybody. He said, you know, I don't, I can't tell you how to do your job. You can do, you know how to do your job better than I do. So I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to give you a strategic directive and you guys figure out how to make that work. And um, it, it did pull everybody together, right? Is that it, 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 everybody was, everybody felt empowered, right? They felt, they felt like they were part of a bigger thing rather than being ordered around and really, I think, helped them a lot. And, you know, and I do see that social thing happening in groups too. I hate open offices, but in one of the big open offices I was working in, we were doing TDD and, and mob programming and that kind of stuff. And I was talking about creating your own workspace and the team took it, took me seriously. And they literally went out and bought a couch <laughs> and they, and they bought a big monitor and they plonked it down on a desk right in the middle of this open office. Right. So they had this <laughs> little lounge area where they were sitting doing their mob programming, staring at their giant monitor and people would walk by and they said, what are you guys doing? And, Gradually, I was watching that infuse out into the rest of the organization as they explained themselves and people looked at it and they said, oh, that's interesting. Um, so it's not a war. So it doesn't have to be a war. It's that it can, it can be a, a sort of, if it's a good idea, the good idea tends to spread unless there's somebody in the, the management level working hard to make it not spread. Well, because I've seen that one. <laughs> 
Yeah, we lost you. <laughs> but so it, what you were just talking about reminded me of something that happened to me about 20 years ago when we were very early on doing agile consulting. And one of the things that we would do is we would advise our client before we ever came out to do the teaching of test-driven development and pair programming and all that stuff. Before that, we'd say, you got to get your programmers out of offices and into a, into a room and set up with tables. And we'd, we'd give them a kind of standard layout. Uh, and, and they would do that. And then um, we'd get this phone call. And it happened more than once. And we'd get this phone call. And the, the managers would say, things are so much better now. <laughs> These people are actually getting things done and they're collaborating and they're talking with each other. And Okay, yeah. If you get people talking to each other and, and working together, they tend to work things out pretty well. But on the other hand, I also participated in a number of events like that where there was a subgroup of programmers in this, in one case, who were literally um, sabotaging the rest of the team because they could not tolerate the value shift. Hmm. Right. And, and, and probably because it was depriving them of some status that they had previously had. Uh, and so they were, they were literally, literally laying plans to sabotage what was going on. And, you know, once we discovered it, um, well, they, they weren't at that company anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the way it has to go. The people complain about that, right? Is they say, oh, but yeah. if, we, if we're going to be agile, we're going to have to get rid of these people that are not willing to be agile. And I go, well, yeah. And they're going, but we can't do that, right? And that, there's some, there's tension in there too. You know, one of the things that I recommend to bigger clients is that if you're really going to try and do this whole agile thing, you've got to provide an out for the people that don't want to do it that's humane. Mm. Yes. Hey, we're going to find you another job. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You don't have to worry about it. Right. As we'll even pay you until you find another job, but you obviously can't work here, but we're not going to make your lives miserable as we'll, we'll, we'll find something that you can't do. And I think things go much easier than when you have a bunch of middle managers fighting tooth and nail for any kind of agility because it damages their status and they, you know, and they don't want to do it. And the, the, it's a big deal. But, you know, I also worry about this in the context of remote because remote, doesn't it doesn't have to be, but it can be very isolating. Um, I look at Hunter Hunter um, Irrigation, right? The, where Woody's whole first came up with, or his team at least yeah. first came up with yeah. the program. And they're still they were 100% mobbing shop, right? right. It's, it's six or eight teams mobbing 100% of the time, and yeah. they all went remote, and they're all still doing it. They're all just mobbing every day. They're just doing it on Zoom instead of doing it physically in the space, and that works, but. There's not much space there to infuse for new ideas to infuse out to the organization as a whole in a remote world because you don't see the whole organization. You just see the team that you're working with. So it can be very limiting. And I, I kind of I see these trends now, right? DHH talking about all remote all the time for everybody. And that can be very limiting. I, I worry. Yeah. I worry about that. It's there's the siren call of not commuting. But on the other hand, I worry about that in terms of the organizations growing. The virtual connection is adequate for some things, but it deprives you of so much human contact and so much interpersonal stuff that can really only be done face to face that I, I'm with you. I agree. It's there's something limiting about it. And I, I fear that we are going to go through a decade of uh, a very sterile um yeah. collaboration. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the word is. Well, well, I'm seeing it happen both ways, right? I'm seeing both. I don't want to use the word introvert because people use it wrong, but there's a class of programmer that just doesn't like to be around other people. Yes. It has nothing to do with introversion, right? So <laughs> just to get this term straight, but, yes. yeah. but um, they love the whole, I'm going to work at home remote for the rest of my life. And I don't, I don't ever want to talk to anybody. Sure. Right? And then, and meanwhile, there are a bunch of incompetent managers going, Oh, we can, we can take all of this money we're spending on offices and we can make our employees spend that money instead. <laughs> Therefore saving us money, right. Is that they have to like set up an office and do all this stuff that we would normally have to pay for, but we don't. So that's great. Right. Because we don't have to pay them money anymore. We don't have to pay money to set up their offices anymore. Yeah. So you put these two things together and it seems deadly to me. And um, I, I worry about that. Is that the, the yeah. I, I, you know, they talk, people talk about productivity while at the same time doing everything they can to prevent it from happening. And the, well, the, because they don't understand what, where the productivity comes from. 
Yeah. Right? It's per- perfectly reasonable to sit there and say, well, you know, I could, I, I don't need a parking space. I don't need parking lots. I don't need all this infrastructure. Everybody can work from home. We don't even need a building anymore. And it seems like you're saving a lot of money, but you don't know what the cost is. And, and by the way, that's, that's the same thing that happened 20 years ago with offshoring. All the, you know, all of a sudden we're going to we're going to have people in X country and people in Y country. They're all going to write this code and it's all going to come here and it's going to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out well. <laughs> yeah, worked out pretty well. <laughs> yeah. But it took 10 years, 15 years for it to oh, wear so, off. Oh, wow. That's the fear, right? That's yeah. the fear. Another another 10 years of, and all started by this COVID thing. And we're going to be living with the echoes for a good long time. Yeah. Is there any way to fight back? How do you fight back against it? Well, I mean, you and I are sitting having this discussion, and if, and if there's a bunch of people listening to it, maybe they're going to put a little thought into this. Like, well, you know, maybe we should have people come back to the office every once in a while and actually look at each other's eyes and, you know, smell each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually eat the pizzas. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's this effect, you know, of staring at a screen. And and the effect is a lot like um, being behind the wheel of a car looking at the windscreen. It's a lot easier to call someone an idiot <laughs> when you're when you're holding onto the wheel of the car looking through the windscreen. And and if you're on Zoom, all you have to do is kind of mute for a second and you know, say something under your breath and then unmute. Yeah. And everything. You know, and that is a that is a weakening of the interpersonal connection. Yeah, I just don't know how to make that point. It's also it's also exhausting. At least it is to me. You know, I I've been having to do a lot of Zoom teaching, and I can't go for more than half a day before everybody is so exhausted that they can't absorb anything anymore. So here we are. It's a year into this COVID thing, right? And I, I have literally not been on a commercial aircraft yeah. since last March. Right. <laughs> now I own my own airplane, so I can flip around a little bit, right. but. You know, a commercial aircraft I haven't been on. I got an invitation from a, a college in Michigan about two months ago to come out and give a talk. And so I hopped in my plane and I flew out. There was a real quick flight. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I'm on stage and I'm talking face to face with a group of programmers. And it was just wonderful. Oh, yeah. And, it got, you know, and it's like this. I forgot what this is like. I forgot what it's like to look at people in the eye and see their response and have the the, the person to person feedback. Uh, and so I'm I'm just chomping at the bit so that this can start again because yeah, uh, I think there's I think it's very harmful the way we're doing it now. Nice. And it's the way it had to be done, but it's harmful. Well, let's hope for the end of COVID. So is there anything you want to talk about? I've been sort of driving things. You want to drive for a while? What do you want to talk about? Let me tell you what I'm up to. Um, let's see. So, yes, I did write clean architecture a while ago. What else did I write not too long ago? Uh, oh, yeah. Let's see. I don't think I have it up here. I have a book over here. So, oh, yeah, there it is. You know, I do these Zoom things, and then I get a bunch of books out, and I leave them in the pile. Yeah. So I wrote this one not too long ago. Huh. I didn't even know that one existed. Yeah, clean agile. And this, this Alan, is a rant. <laughs> this this is me, you know, the old curmudgeon telling all the young kids to get off his lawn. Lawn. I, I a rant walk through all the agile principles one by one, saying, you know, this is how we did it 20 years ago. This is how it still should be done today. And all the yeah. stuff that everybody's trying to do, probably not a great idea. Anyway, that's the uh that's the old man's yelling at everybody about agile. And I'm in the midst of another book now, which is going to have the title. I think it'll be clean craftsmanship. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a book about disciplines, ethics, and standards, discipline, standards, and ethics in that order. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it tries to climb the, the hierarchy, you know, saying, okay, we start with disciplines. Of course, test driven development is one of a, is a big one. Yeah. refactoring, simple design, things like that, and then climb up another level to the standards. What is it that the executive expects? You know, you, we talked about the ship captain, the submarine captain, right? Mm-hmm. How do you get the, the crew to behave as a unit? And you said, right? Okay, well, you, you empower them to solve the problems, but you give them the problems to solve, right? You set the expectations. 
So the standards are the expectations. Well, how do we expect a software developer to behave? Hmm. And then once you've got that, once I've got that all spelled out, then I go through the ethics. What are the ethics of being a programmer? That may be the last book I write, unless I write a book on closure. <laughs> 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 that one will have a huge market. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Maybe we'll only enclosure. It might sell really well. Who knows? <laughs> Subscribe to the Go to YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming Go to conference using the promo code Book Club. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.